folks. Why Would You Ask That is a podcast that answers some of the weirdest questions. A lot of those are inappropriate for some listeners. If you're squeamish, easily disturbed, or just having a bad day, this may not be for you. But if you've got to know the answers like we do, stay tuned. Why would you ask that? Presented by me, M, they, them, and Karen, she, her, and Remy, he, they. So, two things of note today. Ba 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 ba. Ba 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 ba. One, this is episode fifty. Aww. We made it fifty episodes in. Can you guys fucking believe this shit? Me, an undiagnosed ADHD <laughs> nerd. Made it. 50 episodes into a task. That's because there's three of us and we're all just like, okay guys, we gotta do this! You know. (laughs) I'm so proud. I'm so proud of you guys. Me too. Yeah, I believe in us. In number two, we have another listener question. (gasps) Another listener question! I know, I'm so excited! Two in a row! Wow! I'm so happy! I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and it's from my very good friend, Hot Dog Slim. Hot Dog Slim. Hot Dog Slim. I didn't think he was still around. <laughs> hot Dog Slim wants to know, so what's the story behind Nathan's famous hot dogs? I heard something about hot dog loving gangsters and dead whales. Dead whales? I'm really wondering where the fuck the dead whales come in. All I know, I'll tell you what I know about Nathan's hot dogs. It was a big deal when we switched to Nathan's hot dogs. Really? Yeah. At the uh, at the movie theater where I worked at for a hot minute. You worked at a movie theater? Yeah. It was owned by the library. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the person who stepped in to help the event planning, she's awesome, by the way. She's no longer there. But she's still, she's doing, like, way cooler shit, like, with the Essie Purse Museum, last I heard. I don't know. She's, like, anyway, she brought in Nathan's hot dogs, and people, you got Nathan's. And she's, like, I have, like, an in with them or something. I don't know. (laughs) I have connections with Nathan's hot dogs. She had connections all over Arkansas, so I'm, like, she, she knew everybody. That is completely wild. Then again, I did know the, uh, the guy who delivered all the Doritos chips and the guy who uh, was in charge of stocking the shopper's drug mart when I was living in Rupert and between the two of them uh, things were pretty good (laughs) (laughs) Uh, no other shoppers I could think of in this world would have whole fish for you to buy and pig's blood yes shopper's drug mart y'all so what so I I know that Nathan's is a big deal to some people, but does so Nathan's and whales? Do they hate the whales? Yeah, is Nathan's canceled? <gasps> Were they putting whales in the hot dogs and that's why it was so good originally? I mean, I've got the answers. You do have the answers. You got to give it to us, Remy. Give us the answers. I am dying to know. Did <gasps> Oh my. <laughs> is this what they mean when they say sleep with the fishes? <laughs> <laughs> Sleep with M M. What? Whales are not fishes. Whale sharks are. Whale sharks are. We're talking about whales. Hot dog Slim said whales. But whales are underwater, therefore fishies. Okay. Fight me. I don't have to. The marine biologists that listen will fight you. <laughs> oh gosh. Be prepared. <laughs> No, listen, I know marine biology. I'm just making a point to be an asshole. <laughs> Next question from a marine biologist. What the fuck is up with M thinking that all things that are underwater are fish? <laughs> you know that there are a variety. No, I'm not saying that whales are fish. They're in vicinity of the fish. Okay? <laughs> They're under the water. That's where water is. I mean, fish. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> So, Remy, please tell us, what what does this have to do with, what do hot dogs, Nathan's hot dogs specifically, have to do with whales? I will tell you. 
Yes, for tonight's listener question, we're learning what's behind Nathan's famous hot dogs. Asked by Hot Dog Slim. Hot Dog Slim! Love you, Hot Dog Slim! You listeners, feel free to make up weird names if you want. That's funny. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I love it. So, obviously, you guys might be listening and thinking like, how much can there really be behind that particular brand of hot dogs? It's hot dogs. It turns out there's plenty. So, I like hot dogs fine, but I don't eat a lot of them. And I need them to, like, explode <laughs> before I eat them. Because I just like them all crispy. <laughs> and you can't get that in a microwave very well. And we don't have a grill because we live in an apartment. <laughs> and we're not allowed to have them. So I'm missing out on the Nathan's experience. When you think about fast food, what restaurants come to mind? McDonald's. Mickey D's. Oh, more? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, uh, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, all the burger places. No, I just want, I just wanted your number one, when you think of fast food, what do you think of? Uh, McDonald's. Yeah, McDonald's. You both said McDonald's. Okay, so when you think about, like, what was the first fast food Like, the first thing in the United States that somebody said, this is fast food, the first restaurant that was that, that was that concept, what do you think that it was? Shakes. Shakes? Or do you have a brand? Or was it a a food? What? Sorry. Yeah, restaurant. Like, what, what, like, restaurant do you think started the concept of fast food? I know the answer that's probably more popular is Mickey D's, but I know that it didn't start until the 60s or 70s. Yeah, that was, it was like after some shit. Or maybe it was the 50s. 50s or 60s. It was the 50s. So I think the first, if I had to guess, I would say Nathan's due to the theming of the episode. (laughs) This is a context clue. (laughs) (laughs) This is how I aced most of my tests. Hmm. This test happened right after we read uh, <laughs> uh, 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 a book that you read in high school that I definitely read. Like, some of the questions were like, who was the most... Uh, Genghis Khan. Who conquered the most land in Asia? And, like, they'd list, like... Marco Polo, or <laughs> and I'm like, like Marco Polo's the guy that did the the bathtubs. I mean pools. Yeah, but they it would be like multiple choice, and they'd put like Marco Polo or George Washington, <laughs> and then Genghis Khan, and you're like, well, this is kind of obvious. I feel like, right? <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> My favorite are the professors that put like a stupid answer on the tests. Yes, I do love that <laughs> because they know that their um they know that their students have not been paying a lot of attention. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what I would do. <laughs> I would be like, I think I had one professor who like filled out the whole who like had a full page of questions, but the first was um the first question was if you read this question to its entirety and write your name, you don't have to complete the rest of the test and you get an A. And I was like. No way. <laughs> I think I did it anyway. Because <laughs> I didn't believe him. <laughs> That's so funny. I I was really good at taking tests. So good that uh, I would drive like an hour to get to class. And it was one of those classes where all you had to do was take the test. So I'd go in, go to class for five minutes, and then drive home. Uh, because And because the teacher was alerted as soon as we finished the test. Because... We took it on the computer, and it when it we hit finish, it would ding on his end. He would just look up and go, "All right, Em, see you later," and I'd walk out. People would look at me like, "What the fuck?" And then I'd get a hundred. Damn, this was biology. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So... <laughs> I'm I'm here for the biologies. Sorry. Uh... <laughs> We did get off topic, though. So what was the first fast food? Um, okay, so you both think about McDonald's when you think about fast food. 
You acknowledge that McDonald's was not the first fast food restaurant and that you think that it started in the 30s, but you don't remember with what restaurant. That's where we sort of landed, right? Yeah, this is a good uh, summary of those thoughts. Earliest would be 1910, if I can get credit for that. (laughs) But you don't remember what restaurant, but you're just going to guess that the topic of the restaurant means that it's Nathan's. (laughs) Based on the topic of discussion, yes, I'm going to guess Nathan's. But if I had to say, based on other things, I would say Wendy's. I feel like... I would not say Wendy's. No. No, absolutely not. Disagree. Hard disagree. Now for not that, Wendy's. I'm, I'm just going to look up when <laughs> Wendy's was founded because that may be mad. <laughs> like, no, no, no. Absolutely, absolutely not. not. Me, 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 me. Absolutely fucking not. Okay, so you're right. It was founded in 1969. <laughs> oh. By an old man that lives in Ohio. Ew. <laughs> is it the same guy that does no, Victoria's no. Secret? No, it's not that guy. <laughs> he would never do restaurants. Are you kidding? I don't know, dude. I don't know shit. He's just like clothes and aesthetic lines. That's all he's into. <laughs> he's the same guy that I think he did. Uh, anyway, sorry. Getting off topic. Okay. So just to be pedantic. Arguably, the history of fast food started thousands of years ago. Uh huh. I didn't know if you two knew that. Oh, like as in, uh, kind of like, I mean, at markets, you have people cooking nonstop and like serving you fresh food in that sense. Is that what you mean? Or like street food? No. Yeah, like street food. The archaeological evidence of a fast food establishment. Dates back to Roman times about 2,000 years ago, plus. Well, then. Yeah. Fucking Romans had the, uh, the old fast food hamburger. Mm-hmm. Walking out, scarfing down a, uh, uh, me neighbor's dicker weenies. <laughs> or whatever. I actually wasn't even going to talk about it, but then I decided I was going to talk about it. <laughs> uh, now I'm just imagining Chi and Agonia eating... Wendy's with uh, Aristotle. This isn't as good as the stuff that I would get, but, you know, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and Chidi would be like, I don't know why I'm eating Wendy's, except for that Eleanor told me to. <laughs> 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 because when I told her that they had fast food in the Greek era, that she got real excited. Anyway, sorry. So, well, they didn't have kitchens in their multi-storied apartments, so these, like, bigger growing populations of city dwellers in Rome would buy prepared food at food counters called thermopyleums, and so we found archaeological evidence of that, and those are considered to be, like, the f- earliest evidence of fast food establishments. Oh, okay, so it's, it's like yield fucking... <laughs> microwave yep. meal. I mean, it's it'd be no different than going to McDonald's and ordering yourself a hamburger because that thing's just sitting in the warmer back there waiting on somebody to order it and it's been there for three hours. <sighs> oh, God. Yeah. So, that's that. Um, also, we found perfectly preserved food kiosks from the ashes of Pompeii, complete with signage indicating a menu that included duck, goat, and snails. Snails! Yeah. Uh, And over in China, um, all-night noodle stands can be traced back to the 2nd century during the Han Dynasty. So, North America didn't invent fast food, but North America is credited as, like, reinventing the concept of the modern franchised fast food industry. I see. I see. So if you're trying to think about like the first fast food restaurant, you probably you you probably think of McDonald's, but it's not as you two very cleverly <laughs> sussed out. A lot of websites list that distinction going toward White Castle. Oh, you know, think about it. <laughs> somehow that makes sense. I never even had White Castle. I think I've had it once. The first time I went to Chicago when I was. Coming up to visit family for a funeral, 
We stopped in the middle of the night at a white castle, and we ate it in the parking lot. And I remember my mother looking out in the parking lot and being like, what are those guys doing? And then we just ate the tiny hamburgers, <laughs> and I didn't really care, because I was wondering if I should be sad or not. But I don't remember who died. Well. So White Castle was the first restaurant serving fast food, is usually how it's credited. And it's because they... They weren't getting a lot of business, so they decided to reinvent the way that they were selling their hamburgers. And they built a restaurant where you could see them making their food. <laughs> and um, oh. painted everything white because it evoked the idea that everything was clean. <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. Which is also why they're called White Castle. I see. And then the McDonald brothers said, oh, we should build restaurants that look like that. And then they started doing it. <laughs> Yeah. But before them, we had Nathan's Hot Dogs. Nathan's Hot Dogs. And for context, White Castle opened their restaurant that's regarded as the first fast food restaurant in 1921. Nathan opened his hot dog, his hot dog restaurant. Some articles called it a hot dog stand, but it was a lot more than a stand. It was like a whole little thing. It was like a counter with a full kitchen behind it. Oh. Well, gee, Willis. Uh, in 1916. 1916. You said Nathan's 1916. Yes. So I was right, technically. Technically. <laughs> he opened his, he opened his first Nathan's Famous Hot Dogs at the corner of Surf and Stillwell Avenues on Coney Island in 1916. And they called it a grab joint. Because the term fast food didn't show up until the 1950s. That's so funny. What if we still called them grab joints? I mean, you technically could still call them that. That is what you're doing. <laughs> I would expect something else, though. I'm going to go to the grab joint. Oh, yeah, pick me up some weed while you're out there. <laughs> nah, dude, it's a uh, hot dog. Great, that'll go great with the weed. Bro, if your dick has a joint in it, I'm a little worried. What? It's a hot dog. Grab joint. Oh. Grab joint. Oh. Are we making jokes about two different things? We might and we're just be. Not getting each other's jokes. I thought you said weed, <laughs> and I was like, I did say, I did say weed, <laughs> but now I'm confused about the joke that we were making. So <laughs> 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 I don't know where I'm at <laughs> Remy, help us. <laughs> Get us out of here. Well, Beat me up, Scotty. <laughs> okay, so Nathan and his family were from Poland. And Nathan came over here as a with a group of other people, as with a group of Polish Jews who were leaving Europe after World War I. Smart move. Nathan's family, yeah. Nathan's family were having a hard time financially. He was one of 13 children. Oh, Holy whoa. shit. Yeah, so I can't imagine why they were struggling to make money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, even, it's not like the money that you make is immediately going into the mouth of your children. Yeah. Thirteen children! Mm-hmm. His father was a shoemaker, and was, oh. at, at the time that Nathan was 11, was having such a hard time making money that he was going door to door and it said town to town in one article like begging for work and for money to support his family so at 11 nathan got a job in a nearby town at a bakery where he would sleep on the floor near the oven and then wake up at midnight so he could prepare the dough to make bread for the next day damn kid yeah damn. so at 19 he got on that boat and came over to the united states Six months after his arrival, he started working at a store called Max's Busy Bee. Not a store. A restaurant called Max's Busy Bee, which was a luncheonette counter in Manhattan. And then a few months after that, he took one of his cousins to a day at the beach, and they went to Coney Island. Coney, Coney Island isn't really as big of a thing now. Okay. Because, like, Donald Trump's dad bought off a huge bunch of it and knocked a bunch of it down and then some other real estate guy bought off a bunch of it and knocked a bunch of it down they wanted to build like high rises and stuff where the attractions used to be so there's some of coney island left like the 
what the Ferris wheel, I think, is still there and stuff. But the Coney Island used to be, like, enormous and used to be, like, one of the world's most famous amusement parks back then at the time. I actually, uh, my grandfather collected stuff. Uh, I believe I might have silver nuggets somewhere, or my dad might have it with the Coney Island logo. I don't know a whole lot about Coney Island. A lot of my family history isn't up there. I've heard it's, I heard it was pretty cool back in the day. So Nathan went to Coney Island with his cousin and they like strolled through all these attractions and there was a huge amount of them. They ate Cracker Jacks, which are called the, which are sometimes called the first junk food, but that would be a different story. So I won't get into it, but in any case, they were doing fun things. Yeah. All, all the Nathan loved it at Coney Island, and since he was looking for a way to make extra money, he decided to look for like a weekend job there, and he ended up at Charles Feltman's restaurant on Surf Avenue, which was just across from the heart of Coney Island, Luna Park, and got a weekend job there as a roll cutter. Roll cutter? Because what is that? I'm gonna tell okay. you. Because Charles Feltman was another was an immigrant from Germany. Like, I mean, they were, like, fellow immigrants together, which is why they, I think, sought each other out, probably. It was a rough time <laughs> in America to be an immigrant right in between world wars. Yeah. So... Charles Feltman was probably the one who, sometime in the 1860s, first served something like a hot dog. He didn't call it a hot dog. Frankfurter. Yeah, basically. And it didn't exactly look like a hot dog. He called it a dachshund sandwich. Oh. <laughs> I know that makes sense, though. That's adorable. <laughs> so that's why, yeah. is that why they call it not. hot dogs? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> what? Wait, so... Is it a, is is a hot dog a sandwich? I mean, yes, it's meat between two slices of bread. Yeah, I mean, according to the guy who originated them in the United States, they're a sandwich. He called them a sandwich. If I ask for a sandwich and you bring me a hot dog, honestly, I'm not going to be mad. But I know some people that will be mad. <laughs> I mean, nowadays <laughs> they're their own thing, but I mean. They're basically Back just the a day. subsection of a sandwich. It's a sub. So, yes, Charles Feltman, um, he's the one back in the 1860s who probably served the very first thing that was basically a hot dog here in the United States. And he called it a dachshund sandwich. Or, dachshund sandwich. yes, when he got, when he opened up his lunch counter at Coney Island, a Coney Island Red Hot. A Coney Island Red Hot. Yep. I like that better. <laughs> so, hot dog slim. <laughs> hot Which dogs. do you like better? <laughs> <laughs> so, unlike today's hot dogs that have like they don't have the skin on them, his hot dogs had sheep's gut casings tied at both ends like a bratwurst, and he would sell like upwards of forty thousand of those a day. Wow! Right, fucking on, yeah. bro. People loved them. So before long, Nathan just quit the job that he had in the city, and he just started working f working for that guy over on Coney Island all the time. And then eventually he just opened his own hot dog store, his own little restaurant on Coney Island. And then also he just lowered the price of his hot dog by five cents compared to Feltman's ten cents. That's kind of mean. It's a good business. <laughs> like, damn, bro. I mean, it's it's just good business. It's cutthroat. I don't know why I don't ever think to do this. <laughs> Look up the, like, how much something costs then versus now. <laughs> what was five cents in 1916 to what it is now in 2023? $1.44. <gasps> so if we went to Coney Island... Our future money wouldn't work. Future... They'd kill us. <laughs> I know, I know. But, yeah, $1.44 for a hot dog. That sounds way better than what I get charged for a hot dog at the movie theater. So, what's a hot dog at the movie theater? Like a million dollars? Pretty much. <laughs> so, yeah, 
five cents, which is a dollar and change, which is very reasonable. And importantly, Nathan was running a quote unquote grab and go counter as opposed to Feltman, who was running a sit down restaurant for his hot dogs. Ah. And now here's some background on the Coney Island area and what was going on in Coney Island at the time. So not long before Nathan set up shop on Coney Island, it was a veritable den of criminals. Oh. In its, yeah, in its early years from the 1880s until World War I, Coney Island was known for gambling, brothels, and all-night bars. Wow. Great. Yeah. So here's a quote from author Reginald Wright Kaufman, who wrote about Coney Island in 1909. So this is a quote from 1909. <laughs> quote, It is blatant, it is cheap, it is the apotheosis of ridiculous, but it is something more. <laughs> oh, golly. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> so in 1909, when Reginald Kaufman went to Coney Island and wrote about it, there was also 20 million other visitors that went to Coney Island, and among them was Sigmund Freud. <laughs> what? Wow. Kaufman compared Coney Island to the Grand Canyon and Niagara Falls, like an American landmark. Coney Island had Steeplechase Park, Dreamland, Luna Park. Steeplechase featured the human roulette wheel and the barrel of love, where customers, as they entered the park, were pitched against each other by the barrel's moving floor. <laughs> okay. And Dreamland had something called Lilliputia. Like, from Gulliver's Travels. They're the little people, aren't they? Yeah. In Gulliver's Travel Travels, Gulliver is like a, what, normal-sized person, and the Lilliputians are the teeny-tiny people that he encounters. The ones that, like, nail him down to the ground? Yeah, the ones that tie him down on the ground, yeah. So, in Dreamland, they have Lilliputia, which was a tiny town inhabited by 300 dwarves. So... They had that. Dreamland also had a circus with 27 lions. 27? <laughs> that seems like overkill. Yeah, by a lot. <laughs> I think one lion would probably have been enough for anybody. Nobody else was seeing lions like 27. It, that is an excess of lions. This is why Africa doesn't have lions anymore. Coney Island had them all. <laughs> yeah. Coney Island took them all. Yeah. Jesus. So... <laughs> and a quote from Reginald about about the lions, that the lions were at the beck and call of... Oh, I'm sorry, this is not from Reginald. This quote comes from Oliver Pilot, um, from a book called Sodom by the Sea. Sodom by the Sea! Elaborate? Damn, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so, Oliver describes the 27 lion situation, is that the lions were at the beck and call of, quote... Captain Bonavita, who had soulful eyes and a tremendous handlebar mustache. And I was like, okay, <gasps> okay Oliver. <laughs> soulful eyes. You only say that if you're gay. <laughs> like, not, I'm not saying that in a mean, condescending way. I'm just saying facts. No, we're, we're all gay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just have to uh, emphasize the fact that, yeah, that is an extremely gay way to put that. And I respect it. I mean, you're talking about a man who has 27 lions, and you have to mention the fact that his eyes are soulful. Yes. <laughs> like, how is that the first thing you think of to say? Like, the, the, handle, the enormous handlebar mustache is the second thing. <laughs> like, that, that's most of his face. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and then Luna Park was an, an, quote, electric Eden with a quarter of a million light bulbs, a kind of architectural Little Egypt deliciously sensual quote. That is certainly a way to put that. And that one's a quote from John Kaysen in a book called Coney Island Amusing the Million. Good God. So <laughs> there were wax museums, the Ferris wheels, the roller coasters calculated to quote, make your girl throw her arms around your neck and yell, quote. <gasps> Ooh. <laughs> I mean, there's other ways to do that, but all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so the designers of Coney Island's amusement park wanted not just all of the crazy stuff that was there to be part of the attraction, but as you can tell with, like, 
like up there in what was it the sepal chase area has the like the barrel of love and that like what that throws you against other people just strangers the people who designed coney island's amusement parks had this idea of making the crowd themselves part of the spectacle you know that is a pretty good idea yeah so you get excited strangers enjoying a kind of like promiscuous level of contact with other people escaping from their like average day into this like carnivalesque realm where most of the fun is costing like a nickel or a dime which we just established was like a dollar and change <laughs> and so you're getting skeet shooting and sideshows and 27 lions <laughs> and whatever that is a lot to get for that much yeah for a dollar and 16 cents that's quite a lot of things to get. And um, if I'm paying a dollar for every attraction that I want to look at, it's probably going to add up, but also it's not a lot to pay for everything that I want to do. Especially I can go to the state fair now and I have to pay $40 for a wristband or whatever. And there's three things that I want to do there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So one of the most popular attractions on Steeplechase too, which is well, the one with the thing that throws you into other people was something called the Insanitarium. Oh, boy. <laughs> that was a place where a clown dressed as a farmer would tease the, the ladies who were guests at the park, I might add, not performers, in the crowd with an electric prod that he would shock them on their, on their butt with. What? I have so many questions. <laughs> what the fuck is definitely one of them? It seems like it's the only one because it covers the full spectrum of any other question. It is... What the fuck? Yeah, so... And then these, like, the women in the crowd who he has then, like, gently electrocuted, it's specified, gently electrocuted, um, uh. when they're, like... Going away from him, they would pass over a blowhole that lifted up their skirts. <gasps> Diabolical. Yeah. This is kind of criminal. <laughs> I guess you have paid to go in there and you know what's happening, so... Mm? What the fuck? Like, I, I was reading this and my initial response was exactly what's happening with you. <laughs> but then I have to think... I don't know. Everybody has paid money and ha is is a consenting adult agreeing to be in this space. So maybe they're into it. Maybe early dungeons. I just would be afraid that they're uh, they they don't know that they're sign what they're signing up for. But I mean, hey, if if they're into it, go off, have fun. Oh, but Karen, <laughs> right in the middle of this whole situation in the insanitarium space. There is a big tree with hot dog branches <laughs> with ladies' underwear hanging off of them. Okay, that's way more sexual than it needs to be. So, I think they're aware that this space is going to get pretty racy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have to know at this point. Um, leave Grandma at home. <laughs> or at least not in that area. Leave her with the 27 lions and the man with the soulful eyes. She'll she'll know what she's doing over there. That's her own kind of porn. That's my porn. <laughs> so, the stuff that I was reading about the history of Coney Island said, quote, the one respectable attraction, quote, at Coney Island <laughs> was the Premature Baby Incubators run by Dr. Martin Coney or Connie. I don't know. Coney. Um, and he saved thousands of babies with advanced medical techniques using his incubators. Then, And he would put these babies in the incubators on display and charge people money to look at the babies in the incubators. Um, I mean, okay. if the mom's consented, I guess? I feel like that's a weird thing. That's really weird. That is extremely strange. That seems unsafe. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> so at Neither am I. I only play one on TV. <laughs> So at least one woman returned each week for years to watch the development of the babies. It cost 25 cents to see the incubators. Okay. Five billion dollars. <laughs> oh, probably like 25 cents? Probably like 30 bucks? Five bucks? Maybe? Ten thousand dollars? I don't have a concept of this money. Uh, seven dollars and twenty cents. 
I mean, if you have the money to spare and you don't mind that sort of thing, I could see some women really enjoying that. I just, I just would be afraid that it's not safe. I'd be like, why do you have babies here? This isn't... Lots of women like looking at babies. Like, you go to, like, the labor and delivery area because your family member is up there or whatever. Everybody stops at the nursery and stares at the babies through the, through the window. I mean, I get it. <laughs> I mean, I look at cat babies, but human babies all look the same to me until, like, a certain point in their development. But if you show me a newborn baby, I'm like, that's a weird old man. They all kind of look like that. <laughs> yeah. People have shown me so many baby photos. This is so cute. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Tiny little old man. That's a guy. I don't know. My friend Nicole showed me pictures of her baby when she had her. And I was like, oh, my God. That's the cutest baby I've ever seen. And I meant it. Okay. Because <laughs> that baby is so cute. And she dresses her in all these little flowery things. It's the cutest. I'm obsessed. <laughs> She's so cute. Anyway. Karen gets it, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, yeah, he charged 25 cents to see the incubators, but then he had to cut prices eventually. In 1940, Dr. Dr. Coney said, Dr. Martin, because I don't actually know if that's how you pronounce his last name. Dr. Martin said in 1940, quote, Coney Island is so degraded now, even the hot dogs only cost a nickel, that people are bargaining to see my babies, quote. <laughs> so, oh my God. I have the baby incubators on our list for a future episode already, so I'm not going to say anything else about the baby incubators, but I have them on our list already, so we'll talk about them at some point. We might have to, but right now I'm still wondering what whales have to do with guessing now Coney Island. Yeah, I'm linking back to it now. Like the whole thing. Awesome. So this was the environment where Nathan was setting up shop. <laughs> Obviously, he had no shortage of customers. <laughs> In 19... Just judging by that fucking beach picture. Jesus Christ. Yeah, judging by everything I've just read, even there's so many people came here. There was so much to do. If I was alive in 1916, I would probably... And living up there, I would probably go to Coney Island a lot if I had money... <laughs> So, in 1919, he had good luck also because they put in a train stop 100 feet away from his store. Oh my god. Yeah. That's like winning the lottery. Yeah, so after a long train ride, everybody everybody's going to want something to eat or something to drink before they go and hit the beach or the attractions. So they'd stop at his place and get a hot dog or a lemonade or something. And then on the way back, they're all sunburnt and tired and stuff. And so they're going to stop again and get, again, food or pineapple juice or a lemonade, which were some other specialties of his. And as time went on, Nathan just expanded his operation to include burgers, seafood, and just lots of other things as time went on. And french fries, like from the beginning were also a huge thing for Nathan. Like, he was, Nathan was, like, fanatical about the way his business ran. So fanatical about the quality of, like, even the french fries, which isn't even the main staple at Nathan's famous hot dog restaurant, that he went to Maine to look for the best potatoes, and then when he found them, he would buy an entire farm's crop of potatoes. Jesus Christ, dude. Yeah. That's a lot of fucking potatoes. Yeah. Public suspicions about hot dogs were rife, even in 1916 when he first opened. This comes from Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle of 1906, which is just a stomach-churning novel about the unsanitary practices oh, yeah. of slaughterhouses. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, so the hot dog first got its name from a cartoonist named Tad Dorgan. <laughs> Sorry. I said that I had only read it until just now, and saying it out loud made me want to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he was a cartoonist. They call him the infamous Tad. The infamous Tad? <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Man, this, this is, is the famous Tad. <laughs> T-A-D, T-A Dorgan, Miss Indoor Sports. <laughs> also, I like how it automatically says, here he is, gentlemen. 
man. I'm just, I'm just going to assume that they mean the gentleman is in all of us. The human race. Sure. The world famous Tad. What about Tad. NASCAR? Yeah. <laughs> it's like he was so famous that they, <laughs> that they needed to do a whole thing about him for some reason. Yeah. I Why? Mean, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, how, I mean, he's a, a newspaper cartoonist. Yeah. So, I mean, cartoonists are popular. Yeah, but I guess they were way more popular than people pay attention to them now. Well, I mean, um, you know, the Garfield guy and uh, who's... That's the Garfield guy. Who? Jim Davis. Jim Davis. Sure. Yeah. Jim Davis. And then the Fillmore guy. That one I don't know. That what one, about Bill Watterson? Bill Watterson. Which one was he? Really, Karen? Yeah. Really? <laughs> Kevin Hobbs. Oh, yeah. I'm not making a good point, but uh, I also don't read a lot of nukes. I don't either, but, you know, they kind of did shape a lot of comic stuff. Also, so. you're an artist. Uh, fuck off. Just saying. <laughs> you, you're an artist, but also, you know, for a while you were specifically a comic artist. So... Yeah, yeah. So you needed to learn the history of your craft. I no, I didn't. Yeah, um, I was under no obligation, except for the obligation you put on yourself. Sure. <laughs> Why are you booing me? I'm right. I'm booing you because it's funny. I know. <laughs> but yeah, so <laughs> I'm not making a good example. I'm not a good example of this, but yeah, like I, I get why. He's, what's he what's he drawing in this picture specifically? Oh, I have no idea. Okay, I figured it. I, I found out what I'm trying to find out. Okay. Okay. So, I have to amend my notes because my notes are wrong. And also, oh. the source that I got my Ooh. notes from was wrong. So, oh, no. Oh. So, the source that I was getting my notes from at this point was... What, what source was this? History.com, I think. So, History.com told me the hot dog first got its name from a cartoonist named Tad Dorgan, um, who coined who coined the word hot dogs in relation to talking sausages in a cartoon that he drew, playing on the rumor that frankfurters were literally made of dog. But, that's not correct. <laughs> History.com. What, does it get worse? <laughs> so, History.com? History, history.com of the History Channel. That's wrong. Of the History Channel? <gasps> they got it wrong? Oh my god. Someone tell Giorgio. He'll be very upset that they are fake news. <laughs> Sorry, Giorgio is from Ancient Aliens. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that guy with the crazy yeah. hair. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's the number, like, he's the number one draw for the History Channel at this point, isn't he? <laughs> I have no idea. I haven't actually watched the History Channel in a long time. He was the only reason I watched. <laughs> like, the stuff that they put out now is so funny and so bad. It's just yeah, yeah. They, I mean, the History Channel turned into, like, hunting for Sasquatch or hunt, treasure hunts and stuff like that. And I'm like... That's what I go to Discovery for. Yeah. Yeah, like... Because they're more fun. 75% <laughs> of the History Channel's content now is, like conspiracy theory stuff and ancient aliens it's very weird what they have become yeah they used to be really great like as far as like uh i guess not really great i can't really speak to how great it was because it was actually very western and christian centric so but it was cool for me as a young well do gooding do gooder Christian kid to see my God portrayed in such a way on a public TV. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why I specifically avoided it as a kid because I was like, oh, geez, that's very Christian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> it was. <laughs> so, yeah, according to a book called Word Myths Debunking Linguistic Urban Legends by David Wilton, published by Oxford University Press. <laughs> Just to, just to credit that guy. Um, Tad was credited with the use of the word hot dog to mean a hot dog as we know it today, but nobody has ever been able to produce the comic 
where this originated, and by the time he ever used that word to refer to a hot dog, it was already in public usage. Now, to give credit to Tad, mm -hmm. he did he is credited and did correctly actually create and popularize several words and expressions that people actually do still use today. <laughs> yeah, like the use of the word oh, yeah. dumbbell to mean a stupid person. Uh, the phrase for crying out loud as an <gasps> exclamation. <laughs> uh, the, the phrase cat's pajamas as saying like, you know, as a superlative. Yeah. <laughs> Some things that we don't really use anymore, but like at the time was a cool slang, like applesauce to mean nonsense. <laughs> These are the terms that uh, walked right into something that I cannot see around. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Cheaters to mean eyeglasses and skimmer as a word for hat. Um, but back to things that we have you that we do still use, like hard boiled to describe like a detective to mean like tough or unsentimental. Uh, I know I've heard this, but people don't use it really anymore. But drugstore cowboy to mean like a ladies' man. That is an interesting yes. phrase. Or, and this is a really weird one, and we don't use it anymore, but at some point back in his day, they used it, and he's credited with its popularization, or of inventing it at all. As busy as a one-armed paper hanger. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in his obituary in the New York Times, he was, he's, they called him... They said that he was a popularizer of, quote, a new slang vernacular. And his obituary credited him also with the as the originator of the phrase 23 skidoo, calling a hat a binny, and calling shoes dogs. This guy just said shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, he just said this shit. Is, I, I realized where, what it was reminding me of. In um, the, the Music Man. He talks about, uh, like, all the ways that trouble is forming in, in the town, and they're like, <laughs> like, the, the words are, are certain words creeping into your son's conversation. Words like, swell, or so is your old man. And everyone goes, ah! <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that's, that's bad. That's bad. You've got trouble. Wow. Right here in River City. With a capital T, and it rhymes with P, and that stands for pool, as in billiards. Yep, that's uh, apparently words like that and slang like that is seen as, you know, not great. <laughs> oh, I thought you were about to like say some like cancelable things, and then you're like, oh, I no, shouldn't no, no, say no. that. No, I meant like I I walked into it and then I the brain went. <laughs> Your brain just couldn't do it. Yeah, <laughs> <Hey>. yeah. <laughs> it, it went four oh four. Files not found, and I'm like, ah! <laughs> so yeah. And then W J Funk of the Funk and Wagnalls Dictionary Company said that said that T A Dorgan Tad. Was the top of was at the top of the list of the ten uh, like most like whatever that that he was one of the greatest makers of American slang for his age. That spells trouble. He uh he did sports stuff for the newspaper, but he also made political cartoons. So because of his drawing of political cartoons, I think is what looped him into the hot dog situation because. Uh, hot dogs and the abhorrent slaughterhouse conditions was a political issue. So the earliest use of hot dog that I've been able to find now in reference to what we think of as a hot dog is a short video from Thomas Edison about hot dogs where they're called hot dogs <laughs> and um, it's a skit about them using dogs for meat in hot dogs. He would make that joke. That elephant killing tyrant. Well, it's not a joke. It's a skit about how hot dogs are terrible because 
slaughterhouses are terrible places and they use dogs for your sausages. Listen, this is a very complex thing. Slaughterhouses are terrible, but they're not using dogs. And Thomas Edison is making a point, I guess. But also, Thomas Edison is a fucking moog or whatever. I don't like him. Nah, he's awful. He sucks. Also, he stole he stole most of his ideas. Yes. Anyway, feel free to not watch this video because it sucks. And I'm not even going to share it with our listeners because everybody's basically <gasps> in blackface except this mm. one guy behind the counter. No. But it's... here it is. Yeah, I don't want to yeah, watch it. Yeah, don't watch that. it. I'm just <laughs> sharing it so you can look at it. Like, so you can see that it exists. Yeah, don't click on it and don't watch it. But there it is. There's, there is it existing. There, is, there it is existing. <laughs> Thomas Edison, you suck. <laughs> so there's that. So Nathan was like, no, we don't make hot dogs with dog meat, obviously. So instead of so trying to get ahead of this, he put up a sign saying, no horse meat <laughs> at his store. Because this was an actual real possibility, because there was a factory nearby that supplied Coney Island with horse meat for its hot dogs. Wait, what? I mean, yeah. I mean, horse meat is edible uh, meat, but... It is, but I, I'm asking, like, why did he specify no horse meat if horse meat was okay to eat? I don't think people wanted to be... I, I would eat I don't horse think, meat. I don't think the average person wanted to be eating horse meat. Yeah, there's a stigma. Oh. Um, I'd eat a horse. I think, and this is speculation, but, like, people who are living, like, out in the rural areas probably didn't particularly care if they had to eat their horse, because if your horse has a lame leg and can't work anymore, what else are you going to do with it? But people who are living in New York City probably were not going to want to eat a horse. That's my speculation. Well, it's me. I <laughs> I don't know. I know. I've already made it known I would eat Karen, so. <laughs> All the horse girls are, like, freaking out right now. I'm gonna get canceled again. So, also, just to remind from the very beginning of my talking, Nathan was Jewish also, and Jewish people shouldn't eat horses. Oh, well, there you go. Oh, I forgot about that. Horses are not kosher. Yeah, um, because horses can only eat, or sorry, horses, <laughs> Because Jewish people can only <laughs> eat certain kind of hooved animals, and horses are not one of them. Um, horses are not ruminants, and they do not have cloven hooves, and therefore they are not kosher. So he, he put up a sign saying that they weren't making their hot dogs with horse meat, and his little like lunch counter didn't have rabbinic supervision, so he put up a sign saying kosher style <laughs> also. Um, as a way to, like, reassure his Jewish clientele, his hot dogs are made with all beef. All beef hot dogs. And also about his hot dogs, his wife, he met his wife when she was working as a waitress <laughs> uh, in proximity to him when he, before he owned this business. Sorry, the, the thing about the horses uh, and, and their, their hooves, that, that's not the issue. Because the, they actually, the hooves that they have are... Similar to cow hooves, I think. No, horses and cow hooves are very different. Haven't you ever watched those damn videos where they're cleaning them? But, so different. But, like, pigs have cloven hooves. Right. It's the combination of things is why they can't eat horse. Yeah, horse. yeah. Animals that have cows, animals like cows, sheep, and deer that have divided hooves and chew their cud may be consumed. Pigs should not be eaten because they do not chew their cud, even though they have that type of hoof. Yes, there we go. Horses don't chew their cud. And they don't. And they have bad, bad hooves. <laughs> yeah. I googled it before I said the thing about them not being able to eat horses, because I wasn't actually entirely sure. Because <laughs> I, I thought you said that the horses have, like, they, they can't because horses don't have cloven feet, and I was like... Mm -hmm. I said because they're not ruminants, which means chewing their cud. Which I should have specified, because not everyone knows what that word means. <laughs> I don't! <laughs> okay, so it's the combination of those two. Yeah, it's the combination of the things. They have the wrong kind of hoof, and they don't show the chew their own cud. Thank you. Yes. So yeah, anyway. So he met his wife, Ida, while they were working together... Not while he was a boss. 
and they went in together to buy the restaurant. So it was her grandmother's spice recipe that they used to make their hot dogs. And that recipe has not really changed at all in the last hundred years. Aww. That's kind of yeah. cute. So it's delicious. And with that and with their, like, run of luck, the success still didn't happen overnight. People were suspicious. And of, the f of like, the where it came from, but also... If you put aside their suspicion about the meat content, the dogs themselves were still half the price. And, like, we know when people say you get what you pay for, people were concerned because they were like, why are these things so cheap? <laughs> so, Nathan loved a marketing ploy. <laughs> so, he paid some people to wear white coats and come and sit at his, stand at his counter to eat his hot dogs. And people thought those guys were doctors. <laughs> What? Yeah, they saw the white coats and they said, ah, those people must be doctors, and if they're eating those hot dogs, then they're okay. Oh, no. So, by the time that the Great Depression happened, Nathan's was, like, really renowned all over the country. Nathan's, Nathan said, I know I'm selling good food, I just gotta make people <laughs> also believe that I'm selling good food. I'm gonna pay people to pretend to be doctors. <laughs> That'll do it. That is amazing and hilarious. Yeah, because Nathan was selling good food at his at his little restaurant. He cared obsessively about quality and service. In the beginning of his restaurant, he slept in the store on the potato sacks, like he did when he worked at the bakery when he was a teenager. He just never he just couldn't let, sleep in a bed, I guess. He would wake up whenever a customer rang the bell for service, even if it was like three in the morning. That's too much. Yeah, that's... Yeah. They spent virtually, him and his wife, all of their waking hours in the store. Christ. That's a lack of work-life balance. It's true. Seriously. It's true. It is a lack of work-life balance. Um, but that's what they did. Um, he became, like, a really shrewd publicity campaigner for special celebrations. When they gave out, like, free hot dogs, Nathan made sure they were larger than usual. <laughs> So the new customers would be like, <laughs> oh my god, these hot dogs are so big and so tasty. And then they would come back. Good lord. Uh, he paid his employees really well. Nice. Yeah. And he would give out free hot dogs to people who couldn't pay for them. Oh. Yeah. He hired and promoted minority workers. People said that he was a hard man to like, though. <laughs> <laughs> Not because he was mean, just that he was a micromanager. Oh. Uh. One of the quotes that I found said that he was suspicious of any employee who had a clean apron because they weren't working hard enough. Uh. Oof. The, if you got time to lean, you got time to clean. Yeah. And that he would check the garbage cans for food that shouldn't have been thrown away. And this scene, you gotta remember, though, that he was coming from World War I, Poland, and so he's coming from wartime. He was a child during wartime. And this is probably just the attitudes he's bringing with him from a childhood of just abject poverty and hunger. Yeah. Yeah. Because I grew up with abject poverty and hunger. And I have a really hard time with um, food and food hoarding and throwing away food that needs to be thrown away even. So that's probably where that behavior was stemming from. <laughs> but then... The, in the 19-teens and 20s, nobody's being diagnosed with complex PTSD. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, during World War II, Nathan's famous hot dogs was the one spot on Coney Island that was left open. It was literally the only spot of light on Coney Island. <laughs> Dude is nuts. Yeah. <laughs> A little. Um, the rest of the island was subject to a blackout because German U-boats prowled the Atlantic coast, but Nathan convinced the government that he could shut down his business in 60 seconds in case of an attack, so he stayed open 24 hours. This guy's not okay. Wow. Like, someone help him. Go back in time and help him. During the, so like, and counting coins was like the hardest thing to do. At his store because they were filthy, coated in sand, suntan oil, and grease and such. In pre yeah, in pre-war days, 
you had to count them by hand and roll them by hand in the paper tubes to take to the bank. And um, one of my sources said that his sons did that for him. Mm. Yeah, their names are Murray and Saul. And during World War II, both of those, both of his sons went and fought in World War II. Oh, wow. Yeah, and both of them came back. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank goodness. I would have cried. So good for those guys. And it's funny because one of these, one of these sources, uh, I put all our sources on the resource page. This one was from Politico, I think, was where this quote came from. Anyway, one of my sources specifically said that his son Saul came back from the war as a card-carrying communist. <laughs> wow! And that for him. Murray came back as an, quote, ardent Francophile. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> oh. So, Murray oversaw Nathan's expansion to locations outside of Coney Island, and Saul, he left the company in 1963 to run the Snack Time hot dog stand in Midtown Manhattan, so they were still both in the business, but not on the Coney Island business area. At their peak of success, they even had royal customers. What? When President Franklin Roosevelt hosted King George VI of England, obviously, uh, at a picnic in Hyde Park in 1939, First Lady Eleanor decided to make grilled hot dogs part of the menu. So that got a lot of press coverage, obviously. One month before the picnic, Mrs. Roosevelt mentioned mentioned all of the hubbub in her syndicated newspaper column, where she said, quote, So many people are worried that the dignity of our country will be imperiled by inviting royalty to a picnic, particularly a hot dog picnic, quote. <laughs> but um, King George VI really, really loved the hot dogs. Like, he ate, he ate more than one helping of hot dogs. <laughs> Amazing. Good for him. Uh, and now I'm just going to wrap up by mentioning the two things that Slim wanted to know about specifically. Because he wanted to know... I, yeah, I really want to know myself. He, so. he wanted specifically to know about gangsters and whales. He asked about what's the deal with, like, the origins of Nathan's hot dogs, so I've given you all of that, because I found the history worth talking about in general. But, because I love a good American, like, United States entrepreneurial, like, dream come true story as much as the next person. Like, good job, Nathan. But now I'll mention specifically about the gangsters and the whale. <laughs> the gangster thing... It, it's just like, meh. Meh? <laughs> so I, meh? I talked about the background of Coney Island and how just like lots of criminals used to go there and hang out there. And then there was just a ton of crazy attractions there after after that. The one guy's book is called Sodom by the Sea. <laughs> so, so there's that. A lot of famous gangsters hung out on Coney Island. And as such, Nathan's Hot Dogs being on Coney Island, gangsters ate there. So... Famous gangster Bugsy Siegel and Al Capone were fans of Nathan's famous hot dogs. Al Capone, in particular, whenever he was home in Brooklyn, would stop and eat at Nathan's hot dogs. So they were just in proximity. Yeah. Uh, Al Capone just really liked them. I also found a story from more recent times that said that um, that there was recently some laws changed that says that now you it's legal to gamble on um, Nathan's hot dog eating contest. It was illegal at some point? Like, this was a thing that they had to say? Yeah, gambling is generally illegal outside of, like, certain venues, you know, outside of casinos and stuff. It's illegal to gamble. Uh-huh. Unless it's Nathan's hot dog eating contests. So now it is legal to gamble on, it's like you can, it's legal to gamble on what, the NFL and Nathan's hot dog eating contest now. <laughs> this is so weird. Okay. Yeah. Very weird and specific. It's because Nathan's hot dog eating contest is considered to be like, um, it's uh, one article I read 
called it like the epitome of freedom or something. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's just because that has literally been going on since 1916 when Nathan opened his first hot dog stand. Hmm. Well. Yeah, it says, legend has it on the 4th of July in 1916, two immigrants settled an argument over who was the most patriotic by having a hot dog eating contest. Which is true. That's what happened. <laughs> that is extremely weird, but okay. Yeah. The now famous contest became a, an, quote, Independence Day institution, quote, as the New York Daily News puts it. The competition has been canceled only twice since, in 1941 to protest the war in Europe and in 1971 as a rebuke of civil unrest and the reign of free love. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I found the quote. <laughs> it says, turning gluttony into a spectator sport is the epitome of Americana. <laughs> um, <laughs> that makes our nation's yeah. birthday the perfect day for the granddaddy of all competitive eating showdowns. Quote, the hot dog contest is a physical manifestation of the concept of freedom, quote, said George Shea, the mastermind behind the Nathan's famous hot dog eating contest in Coney Island. The contest has come to represent the spirit of July 4th itself. It's a kind of a pilgrimage to the center of July 4th and the center of freedom, quote. Uh, this is, these are quotes from George Shea. From an article from Politico called An Inside Look at America's Weirdest Independence Day Tradition. <laughs> Why is it freedom? Is it just the freedom to fucking inflate your stomach in a really unhealthy way? So, those were the those are the things people have been betting on it since 1916. Uh, and now it's legal to do so. And also Al Capone really likes it. <laughs> Good God. Um, because because it literally started on the fourth of July. And has just been going since. <laughs> that is so funny. But what does this have to do with whales? The whales are unrelated to the gangster <laughs> situation. <laughs> well, okay. We just want to know what whales have to do with Nathan's hot dog. That's all I want to know. Now I'll talk about the whale. Yes. Thank you. I'm dying. I know you are. That's why it's the last thing. <laughs> so, Nathan used interesting marketing gimmicks to get people to come over and eat his hot dogs and get over their initial suspicions. We, we've said that. We've talked about a few. When his son Murray came to work with him at his, like, original location, Murray decided to find his own marketing ploy, and it was weird. In 1954, Nathan went on a business trip to Miami, and Murray was in charge of that original location. So, a stranger like a kind of con man, by the name of Leif Sagard, arrived one day at Murray's stand, and curiously, Leif had acquired an embalmed finback whale and was looking to rent it out as an attraction. What? What? I found a comparison picture, like immediately Please. after I sent that. It's a big fucking whale! <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, it's like, uh... What are they trying to do? What do they do? Chain it to the fucking dock and pray? <laughs> <laughs> it's um, three-fourths the size of a blue whale for the people listening. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's pretty big. <laughs> well, let's let's put out um the actual, like, uh, I'm, I'm literally, I'm looking it up to see. It is a hundred thousand pounds on average. An average of 89.6 feet, or 27.3 meters. Yeah, it says it's 72 to 82 feet for the ones for the ones in the audience who don't know meters. That's, I did throw out the oh, feet. Oh, I didn't hear you. Sorry. I reiterated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty large. It's pretty large. <laughs> like, how many, how many six foot tall people is that stacked on top of each other? Hold on. I'm going to divide 89 by 6. That's 14 and 8 tenths of 6 foot people. <laughs> That's 14 Joshes stacked on top of each other. <laughs> There's a picture of one next to it. They are bigger. <laughs> they are huge. These are big ass animals. What the fuck? Like, why? <laughs> 
And what does this have to do with the hot dogs? I like I <laughs> like the I love this initial reaction. <laughs> it's a big fucking whale. Did the whale serve hot dogs and then die while doing it? <laughs> like what is the deal? Did they give it a little apron and it was too small and it died to death? death? <laughs> Who the fuck is doing this shit? <sighs> I'm good. I'm good now. I am. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. <sighs> <laughs> okay. So, this guy, Leaf. Yeah, he says he has an embalmed finback whale, 82 feet <laughs> of whale. Um, and was looking to rent it out as an attraction. Oh, it was already yes. dead? How was he, like, moving this thing around? I have no idea. So, Leaf... Did he have a big-ass truck? Oh, my God. So, Leaf proposed to Murray a deal that would make them both money. Uh, oh <laughs> Leaf God. says that Nathan's restaurant would pay to rent the whale carcass and place it on display in the empty lot next door... To the restaurant. And then Leaf would put this dead whale next door to their restaurant. And um, he was like, this dead whale will bring in lots of spectators who want to come and look at it. And then they're going to buy hot dogs to look at this dead whale and eat, eat their yummy hot dogs while they stare at this rotting carcass. I mean... To be fair, I have gone to a museum and just stared at a bunch of carcasses. Are they actively rotting not... in front of you? No, they were very nicely engaged. And preserved, yeah. Yeah. Well, you said embalmed, so I was like, oh, did they just stick it into gallons and gallons and gallons of formaldehyde in a nice sealed tank or something? You're telling me that this was just, like, out? Yeah. Well... I yeah. did describe just... Leaf as a con man of sorts. So Murray agreed to the plan, and he paid to have a 75-foot-long, 70-ton whale placed on display in the hopes of generating more foot traffic. This is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Yeah. And then his dad was like, Murray? Mount my head on a pike and see if it sells you more hamburgers, McDonald's, what's your face? <laughs> Fucking was hell. Was Murray the communist or the Francophile? Francophile. Love to see Ronald McDonald pull this shit <laughs> off and recover. So, yeah, uh. this plan was very stupid for a few factors. Um, for a few reasons. The biggest one was that this was a big, big rotting whale. <laughs> and the smell. Nothing, the smell is not appetizing. No, nothing was protecting the whale from rotting in the hot, hot sun. Um, <laughs> so, um. Do you think people, like tore at it with their teeth <laughs> like they do underwater. <laughs> They're like, you know, like when you have a whale skeleton on the bottom of the ocean and like everything eats every bit of it. Do you think people just like walked up and eventually were like, I'm going to take a piece of this whale and then walked away because people do do that. They just take things. Yeah, but not with their teeth, I imagine. Unless they like did it for a dare. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe somebody's like, you ever wonder what whale meat tastes like? Bro! Because that's how they talked in, in the early 1900s, apparently. This was a bad <laughs> idea. A bad idea. Murray. Very disappointed. Yeah, this was a heinous, What did his dad say? Heinous. Yeah, what did his dad say? His dad can't even, like, roll coins. Like, what, how would he feel Here's about this? a picture this? of the whale. Oh my god. No! Its uh, name is Miss. Oh my its God. name is Mrs. Heroy. <laughs> That's not. They didn't even put it like on its belly. They like flipped it on. Yeah, its they back. just sort of it's... threw it on the ground. <laughs> this is terrible. This is awful. I cannot buy any of this. I... This is the one of the worst decisions I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. This is <laughs> it's pretty bad. Uh, here's a better. Here's a better picture of the whale. <laughs> There's more pictures, though. Of course, there's more pictures of there's the dead whale. Pictures of that. <sighs> oh, yeah. 
I guess it it was working in some way because this person's like just like touching the baby. She's yeah. gonna take it. And the- <laughs> in this picture, they have actually rolled the whale onto its stomach and propped its mouth open with something. And there's a small like a small child. It looks like standing in this rotting whale's mouth, touching touching its baleen. Yes. I don't think that's a small child. That's a full grown woman. Well, there is, there is a woman, maybe. There's a person in the whale's rotting mouth. Does it smell? You don't have to ask how it smells. You know, you know how it smells. <laughs> Extremely bad. I'm, I'm really pleasantly surprised. I didn't think I was going to find any pictures of this. <laughs> you didn't? No, I typed, I typed in looking for pictures of this, and this came up, and I was like, oh my god, there's pictures. Do you think it mummified or liquefied? <gasps> I know exactly what happened to it. Oh my god, please. Mind. Please, please tell me. Alright. So. Did they chop it up and put it in the oh. dogs? Oh my god. So, Can, are, are whales kosher? Oh my god. No, I don't think they are. Crustaceans, such as lobster and crab and other shellfish, are not kosher because they lack scales. All aquatic mammals are not kosher. <laughs> okay, there you go. That answers it. Okay, now we know. Okay, so the, for the first few days of the display, it went fine. But then, it got hot on Coney Island, and the whale began to rot and break down. Do Like, big yeah. time. So... No, it did not mummify. It rotted. So, like, you know, how things how things rot in the heat. I, I don't think I have to describe it, but basically, it just, like, fell to pieces next to his hot dog restaurant. That's so bad. And I know everybody has smelled disgusting roadkill, and this is 70 tons of disgusting roadkill sitting in the direct sunlight. How do you even get rid of that? So, um, yeah, the rotting carcass just sat there next to his hot dog restaurant, um, where you couldn't even go inside to eat your hot dog to get away from it because there wasn't an inside. Oh my god. Yeah. I so, guess they weren't popular for a little while. They weren't popular for a while. It had the opposite effect. The horrible, horrible stench of the whale caused people to quickly leave the hot dog area and not buy any hot dogs. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh my god. So there was a bunch of complaints made by the other businesses around around the area uh, until the health department got involved. Mm -hmm. So somehow they disposed of the whale and returned the rotting carcass to the ocean. Jeez. Well, at least the ocean wasn't very far away. I, do you think they just had a bunch of people like roll it? Down the hill? Just roll it across the beach? I don't think it would... Yeah, you know, and it just, like, splat, I don't... splat, splat, <laughs> splat. Well, they couldn't do that. Oh, there's a fin! <laughs> because if you scroll back up to the pictures that I showed you, he was... His hot dog place was on a boulevard, was, like, on a road. So there was a road in front where, like, people were driving their, like, cars if they had them, or buggies. And then oh, directly right. across from him was Luna Park, which was, quote, the the center of Coney Island. So there was, like, a ton of attractions right over there. Like, how... I, I got so many questions on, on the how of the whale. Like, how did they get it there in the first place? Who decided to take it up off the beach? Be like, hey, whales die all the time, but we're going to sell this one at a profit for display. And then how did they get the now mushy apple? I mean, the... <laughs> <laughs> the mushy apple of a whale <laughs> back down to the ocean like how did they do this I guess the way you would do it with anything just piece Chainsaws? by piece yeah they probably had to cut it up of some kind or just bloated it you put it all in a tarp put the tarp in the truck this could have buggy. all been avoided if everybody took a piece with their mouth like they do on the bottom of the ocean <laughs> I hate that thought. Ah, <laughs> uh, man. Also, um, Nathan. It cost them. It cost Nathan's hot dog restaurant the money to get her removed, 
So they had to pay for it. Mm. And Nathan, Nathan himself was super pissed about this. Also, I opened an, I, would be I opened too. the article where the pictures were coming from. <laughs> And it tells me that the man who sold the whale didn't just find the whale. He went out looking for a whale, specifically for the purposes of selling the whale. And he killed the whale with his crew. What the f- This seems so needless. Like, why? So I have information for you about about how they got the whale there, since you were asking. So, they took her down with a harpoon gun, and then in... Then they uh-huh. had to inject her with seven tons of formalin, which is a mix of formaldehyde and water, in order to preserve her. Seven tons of that. <laughs> and then they didn't immediately sell her. They took her on a tour of 60 cities in seven European countries. What? So she went, she lasted all this time. And then at the very end, they're like, hey, Nathan's hot dogs. Do you think it would be cool if we just put this whale here for a little bit? <laughs> And uh, you could pay us for the honor of it. You know, th- this whale's been all over Europe. She's a well-traveled whale. And Nathan's hot dogs, Murray, said, Oh, you know what? That sounds pretty good to me. I mean, it's a famous whale. <laughs> and so they put it down. And then, like, the dudes walk away for a few days. And the next thing you know, America happens. It's hot. And they're just like, oh, my God. Well. Done here. That's a picture from Time magazine. (laughs) Good fucking In Brooklyn, a crane swings her and 50-ton flat car to the the lighter. Her transatlantic deck passage cost Sagard $23,000. Like, at that point, it's not even worth it. Like, how long was she on tour? Like, how long was she on tour? Uh, it doesn't say. So, (laughs) it's... Yeah, it's so, she was, let's see, scroll back up. It says that she toured on a special rail car that was built for her in Germany, measuring 90 feet long and weighing 50 tons with 16 wheels. Leaf. Uh-huh. So they moved yeah, it by rail. Leaf wanted to exhibit Mrs. Heroy in an educational and scientific manner. So she had her organs put on display as well for the public to learn about whale biology. Uh, so, for example, her heart weighed 1,100 pounds, and her liver weighed 2,000 pounds, and her kidney weighed 1,200 pounds. Oh, I found it. So, the whale toured Europe for over a year. And it only took a few days in the hot American sun for her to go, yep, <laughs> and just fucking melt, like, dropped ice cream. Yep. <laughs> like, Jesus fucking Christ! I'm just, I'm so fascinated by this, though. Like, how how was this a, a con, technically? I guess it wasn't. So, so the whale arrived in America on March 27, 1953, in Brooklyn, and was transported to a holding facility in New Jersey so that they could make a new rail car to work on our train lines. Okay, so it doesn't sound like it was a con. It just sounded like it was going to be the start of the American tour. And they were like, okay, we're going to put her on display for a little bit here. And it's fine. We've done it before. And, like, and they were trying to get the whole rail car situation done so they could move her around, put her on display, and do all that shit. Oh my god, there's so much. There's so much, int- I'm, there's so much in- interesting information here. So the whale lived in this holding facility for a year. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay, so wait, 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 wait. Are we are we going on two years? This this whale was completely fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Leaf had trouble finding the perfect place to exhibit the whale because Leaf because Leaf says that he really wants to display the whale in a scientific manner, like like in Europe. Re- quote: Rather than send it on the road with carnivals or out to Coney Island. Quote. <laughs> Coney Island was the last place he wanted to put it. So, realistically, it was just like, okay, we need to make some more money off the whale while we wait for the rails to be ready. Oh my god. Okay. I I think I get it now. They were not expecting this to happen. Like, he legitimately was like, okay, Coney Island, I guess it's popular. Put it next to the most popular food place I could think of. Nathan's hot dogs. Okay, cool. 
uh, whale be fine, right? The whale will be fine, right? So before the whale, the whale was so not before fine. the whale went to Coney Island, actually. Uh huh. The whale went to Broadway. <laughs> So, okay, how long was the whale in Broadway? So, the whale went to Broadway to Holiday on Ice, where a guy named Maurice Chalfin obtained exclusive rights to exhibit Mrs. Harroy the whale in the United States. And so they dis- <laughs> so they displayed the whale on the corner of 69th Street and Broadway in Manhattan. Uh-huh. <laughs> For how long? Um, it says, let's see, Chalfin and his partner had a 50-foot-long facade erected standing 26 feet high to show off the whale. They hung an Artcraft Strauss painting 50 feet long depicting Mrs. Haroy erected above the turnstiles with painted signs out and everything being lit. <laughs> they made her a whole display. Okay, but... Like, how long was she in Broadway? The whale is accompanied by large paintings of nautical scenes and a mounted whaling equipment collection and will soon have a stuffed polar bear and an Eskimo kayak, it says. They also displayed her with something called Princess Minnie, which was a field mouse. Okay, this is delightful. I would go and see this shit. But, like, how long was she in Broadway? I'm- I'm- I'm getting there. I'm reading. This this man this man Lee says that he wanted one of Earth's largest mammals to display with one of the smallest, and he found this delightful. Yes, and they gave a reduced rate for school children to come and see them, and they sold balloons in the shape of whales. See, this is excellent. Like, sad the whale had to die for for all this to happen. Like the it's a really ridiculous thing, but people killed in the name of science like way before conservation was like, "Oh, we should do that." But like how long was she in Broadway? <laughs> Louis Armstrong performed with the whale. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it says jazz legend Louis Armstrong performed Jonah and the Whale on his trumpet. Jonah and the Whale. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> and there's a picture of a taxidermist on the inside of the whale spraying her with uh, insect repellent. So they were maintaining the whale, getting kind of worried about the whale, like liquefying it says that the picture of the t of the taxidermist says with preservative a taxidermist looks for insects and constantly checks softness whales only smell is of formaldehyde so at two years the whale still didn't stink so leaf okay so okay this article which is from coney island mind you <laughs> okay <laughs> So this article says that the whale's owner, Leaf, did not want the whale to be a weird, quote, weird attraction in Coney Island, quote, but that Nathan's hot dogs reached out to them, thinking that it would draw a crowd to what? the area. What? Oh my god. <laughs> so this guy put his, his, his whale prize into the hands of the hot dog people. <laughs> and a lot of respect. For Nathan and his family. But the whale was a bad move. And Leaf was just... This was not a con. Yeah, yeah. Leaf was conned. <laughs> like, Leaf got the bad deal out of yeah, this. Yeah, shame on you, other source, for dragging Leaf's name through the dirt. So <laughs> he was just like, I, we gotta worship the whale. We gotta take care of the whale. You know, love the whale. Learn about the whale. I killed this whale for education. You know, we went all over Europe. You know, it's on Broadway to be loved and adored, and it's now displayed with the smallest one. You know, it just shows the vast diversity of life. And then you hear, Honk Honk, hey guy, our hot dogs ain't doing so good. Can we borrow the whale? Because apparently, I guess that's what Marie sounds like. <laughs> this is the whale's heart. Bro! Oh my gosh. It's like, yeah, we have to, so we're setting the record straight about Leaf, not a con man. 
dude just was like, okay, yeah, I can, I can give you the whale for a little while. Oh, his poor whale just liquefied. <laughs> Oh my this god. This was um, Murray trying to make a business deal and made a very poor business deal. He's like, I could be as good as my dad. Just you wait. Murray, you fucking idiot. Oh my god. <laughs> and, and then Nathan came and said, I'm moving you away from Coney Island. You open a store somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Nathan, just get the fuck out of here, dude. Get the fuck out of here. You liquefied a whale on our doorstep. This poor man has to go and find another whale. <laughs> like, yeah. Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah. So it says that, yeah, so it says that the, that I guess Murray reached out asking for the whale because he wanted to display the whale on a lot at 3222 Stillwell Avenue because there used to be a, quote, girl show there, but now there wasn't. So they wanted to put the whale there. Murray, what the fuck? <laughs> It says, the exhibit would be tweaked slightly with the added use of a, quote, outside talker, <laughs> quote, to draw in the crowd and the addition of tie-in merchandise sold at a small novelty store on the property. So they moved the whale late at night on April 27, 1954. So the whale was on Broadway uh-huh. for, like, several months. <laughs> and they put the whale on display on May 1st. And then they displayed the whale this- over the summer... Man, did and where it only took a few days for it to just become and it just jelly. died. It says it started to stink. One newspaper said that Mrs. Haroy was giving off quote unladylike odors. Oh my god! Can you fucking imagine, like donating your grandma's body to science because you love her so dearly? You want everybody to be able to learn from her, and she always wanted to be learned from, and all that shit. And, like, you you display her body for so many years, and people are, like, giving her the respect she deserves. And then fucking Ronald McDonald says, Hey, guy! Uh, there used to be a titty show over across the street. Uh, perfect place to put grandma. And you're like, okay. Oh, my God. All right, man. (laughs) We could put grandma there. And you put grandma there, and you have all your grandma shit all ready to go, and you're like, okay, respect grandma. But then they don't put a roof over grandma. (laughs) There's more drama. (laughs) There's more? Oh my god, grandma already melted onto the pavement. What more can there be? I I am so married to to the whale thing. Fact check about Leaf being a con man, not really being a con man. Now there's lots of drama. So they filed complaints, and then Leaf had to go to court. And he said that he would telephone experts in Oslo to see what would make the whale, quote, socially acceptable. Um, so on. So they just put the whale up on the 1st, and it says on Saturday the 10th, Leaf told people visiting that the whale would be gone soon because it was going to start touring on the 12th. And it says... On the 13th, the whale was still there, but it mysteriously caught fire. It what? (laughs) Caught fire. Mysteriously. So that's how they disposed of the whale? No. (laughs) It says, the platform the whale was on mysteriously caught fire and caused major damage to Mrs. Haroy. But what the the fire did not damage, the firemen did. (laughs) And it says, the end, right? No. (laughs) In true Coney Island fashion, the exhibitors were not going to let a little fire get in the way of profits. They continued to exhibit the whale, burned, soaked, and rotting. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, here here is what I'm imagining. This is this is what I'm thinking right now. My psychic vision is hitting me. Someone was like, this whale fucking stinks. And they set fire to the fucking thing. The whale was maybe maybe the whale was insured, you know? We don't know. I don't know that right now. Um, but they they wanted to get rid of the whale. So like, okay, you know what? It's probably going to be a lot easier to remove char than it is to remove a giant 72 ton pile of aspic. So they set fire to it and the firemen came and they like split slap <laughs> split slap split slap. <laughs> and they're like Dowsing. No wonder the whale rotted so bad. It got worse. 
it just got worse. It just, oh my god. Yeah. So then, then the hill department was like, okay, this whale was supposed to be gone now. Uh, so then they sent some court summons to Perkins, who was the manager from Broadway, um, who co-owned the whale's American tour, and to Leaf again, and then sent one to Nathan himself, because he was in Miami at the time. Because Nathan owned the lot next door. Oh, God. And the court said the whale had to be gone, quote, destroyed and dumped under three feet of dirt in a Staten Island landfill, quote. But they dumped it in the ocean instead. According to the other article, so it says in this article that the whale was cut up on July 21st, 1954, and the judge told Leaf, you had better stick to minnows. <laughs> wow. Wow. And that's the end of this article, and that's the end of the podcast. <laughs> wow. What so, the now we know how Nathan's Famous Hot Dogs became the hot dog of baseball, and also the hot dog of hot dog eating contests, and what they ha and how they connect to famous gangsters and dead whales. <laughs> and also, we've set the record straight on owner Leif Sagard, and how he's not a con man, actually. He was running a very scientific operation, <laughs> and it all went horribly wrong. Oh my god. Thanks to Nathan's hot dogs. <laughs> Thanks to Nathan's hot dogs. <laughs> Fucking Murray! <laughs> <laughs> listeners rate and review us five stars <laughs> if you yeah. want to hear more of this kind of um crazy content send in questions <laughs> because i wouldn't have found any of this information out about mrs heroy the whale if you had, if i hadn't got this question from hot dog slim i am obsessed <laughs> thank you hot dog slim i'm obsessed with this fucking whale conspiracy <laughs> because this is a conspiracy yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it's all oh a cover. My God. We're going to get to the bottom of this. All right, guys. If you want your question asked like Hot Dog Slim, you could actually email us at whywouldyouaskthatpod at gmail.com. Again, that's whywouldyouaskthatpod at gmail.com. Or you could go to our website, uh, whywouldyouaskthat.com, and hit that contact button. We got a little form there that Remy made, and you just Put your name in, throw in a question, done. And it hits our inbox, same as uh, if you actually emailed us. If you guys would also do us the honor of maybe interacting with the podcast in some way, you know, subscribe or follow, give us some stars or a thumbs up or a comment, however you want to do it. Or just recommend us to your friends. Just like say something maybe a little bit positive or maybe even like, encouraging in a mean way but like i get bully it. your friends into listening just like i do not really i don't really bully my <laughs> friends into listening everybody we know listens to it willingly because it's really funny when somebody's like so what's your podcast called and would i go like, why would you ask that and they like jeez <laughs> okay wow which i really have had happen <laughs> funny <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't stop being funny uh, but thank you guys for listening and like I said feel free to ask us any questions because we fucking love it we are hitting a year soon and we are so happy to start hearing from you guys so y'all have a good one bye. bye happy episode 50